They're trying to tell us something, and it'd be foolish not to take heed. I post this on my Locals channel. Don't forget to go to my Locals. It's uh, locals. I'll put the link in the doobie-doo. And, of course, sign up for my email list as well. The Great Travel Reset. Bloomberg. Air travel, travel a luxury for many. Flying has moved up market. Reduced social mobility. Hmm. In flashback 2021, the German health minister says climate change travel restrictions will be required. Yep. Uh, this is from Bloomberg. Fewer flights and higher fares make air travel luxury for many. Yep, exactly. Um, the jet era that globalized air travel for half a century, that's critical right there, 50 years, has brought to an, uh, has been, was brought to an abrupt halt with COVID. Now, planes are back but the, in the skies, but flying's proliferation is in reverse. Yep. Fewer aircraft are plying a smaller network, and fares are rough. Hmm. Ticket price. Anyway, I'm not. So this is. So I want to read something else here, too, because this. Hang in me. There is a method to my madness, believe it or not. So I came across this article via LouRockwell.com and uh this is actually another interesting one. The businessman and the Holy Family, and Merry Christmas to each and every one of you guys. Jesus is born. Was he actually born on December 25th? Probably not, but uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Anyway, I, this was a very interesting article. Why the next day, decade will not be like the previous 40. Writer of this blog, um, of two minds.com. I can't remember his name. Charles White, I think, or something like that. Um, I forgot. We'll look at it. Uh, he talks about an article by an economist, um, Russell Napier, we will see the return of a capital investment on a massive scale. And Napier is telling the 40-year period from 1980 to 2020 was dominated by central banks, monetary policy, and markets, enterprises seeking to maximize profits. These forces fueled the rise of globalization by maximizing profits by arbitraging lower labor costs and production costs overseas via offshore production and they did it by globalization and financialization vastly expand debt and leverage but keep debt service low by reducing interest rates yep neither was sustainable near told the, the total dependence on geopolitical rivals in service of private sector profits created the exist exist attention existential 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 national security vulnerabilities which must now be addressed Reshoring, home shoring, and friend shoring critical production. The market, ruled solely by incentives to maximizing profits by any means available, created this invulnerability and is un incapable of resolving it. Yeah. Napier thinks there's going to be a net result of government because the private sector can't deal with uh, not focusing on maximization of profits and the reshoring, what uh, basic domestic manufacturing, and whatnot. They don't have the capacity to build out, is what this guy says. And so he says, government will be taking control of investment and credit creation will mean a huge home shoring boom or friend shoring where we're basically you know, trading among favorable partners as opposed to Russians, the, the Chinese and whatnot. So capital investment on a massive scale will uh, we'll go into the reindustrialization of our own economies. They'll have to create enough credit to fund both this massive investment and capital expenditure called CapEx. Hmm. And he points out the 1946 to 1979 post-war period, an example of governments guiding the economy more than the central banks. And we know that, you know, in terms of the Eisenhower uh, roads and things of that nature, eh, maybe, but uh, let's keep going. Cause I, I have a problem with that as the author of this article I'm going to go into here said all this makes sense but Napier overlooks these three things the energy cliff as hydrocarbon production declines faster than new sources can be brought on to replace them the demographic cliff as workforces decline and the cohort of retirees to be supported balloons the impossibility of funding new capex and infrastructure spending, supporting the ballooning cohort of retirees and consumer spending to keep the waste is growth landfill economy. I want to talk about it here in just a second. Um, in other words, there will be trade-offs. If you want moderate inflation, 
and massive increases in CapEx, consumer spending has to take a hit. Furthermore, inflation will be driven by two forces. Scarcities of essentials like food and energy, which are basically the same thing in an industrialized fertilizer-dependent agriculture, and the expansion of credit in excess of increases in productivity. Yes, 100%. Let me keep going. When it comes to energy, what most people miss is Jevons' paradox. Adding sustainable energy doesn't replace our consumption of hydrocarbons. It simply increases our total consumption of energy. I, all right, so you cannot build a solar panel with just solar panels. You need inputs. Thus, to use solar photovoltaic, for instance, it takes more energy than just using the hydrocarbons as it is. All right, that's just a fact, man. It's just, there's no two ways around this. You cannot build, build windmills and solar panels without the hydrocarbons oil, essentially, to begin with. Or coal. I don't care how you look at it. And it, so you're increasing your consumption of energy, right? Um, we're not replacing it. We're increasing it, but we're getting less bang for the buck. Um, another factor most people miss is the scale of hydrocarbon complex everyone is hoping to replace. And the timeline of that replacement is infinite. Um, we can't replace anytime soon. Um, decades of investment, alternative energy supply is only 5% of global energy. And those pounding the table for nuclear rarely mention how long it's going to take to get nuclear power plants online. The cheap to get oil has already been extracted. What's left costs more to get. Yes, technology improves, but physics wins. And in the end, more energy must be expended to get the harder to get oil from the ground. 100%. I, I mean, again, it matters not in oil. It matters not in coal. It matters not in sustainable, whatever, silly green stuff. It takes more energy to get it than to use it. I mean, so we're increasing our consumption inherently. I'm telling you, that's why I'm, I'm tying this video with they know something you and I don't and starting with the, the, the ability to fly is going upscale. All right. These realities dictate an energy cliff in which oil production declines faster than new sources can be brought online and rather than consume more energy as new sources are brought online will consume less of it but will cost more. So we're going to produce more energy, but the net result is we're going to consume less and it's going to cost more because it takes more energy to give us what we need. And it's going to cost more, become scarce. The demographic cliff is equally baked in. The workforce of the next decade cannot be expanded. I cannot agree with that more. It's already here. And along with a soaring cost, a soaring cohort cost for the cohort of retirees. Since the global system is optimized for expansion, the contraction that will upend the entire global economy is already configured into it, 100%. On top of these, these three factors, there's a soaring healthcare cost generated by lifestyle diseases. Diabesity is what he says. Great term, man. Like a great term, diabesity. High levels of pollution in developing uh, countries as well in an aging populace. Profiteering doesn't generate health, and profiteering has been the name of the game for so long Few can imagine any other way of living. Mainstream, the mainstream assumption is the status quo will continue on as much as before. This is just as unlikely as impossible if total energy produced and consumed declines. Yep, um, 100%. So I want to share with you something here. And here's when world population is more than tripled since the 1950s. Energy consumption has increased at more than twice that rate. The fact is absent from discussions of climate change and continued economic growth. All right, so I want to show you something else. First chapter of his book, Self-Reliance, that you can get for free. Charles Hugh Smith. Uh, it's a great, I check this out. Self specialization and fragility. Our economy is optimized for specialization because that's how our economy becomes more productive. By mastering one skill, each worker can produce more than non-specialists, which is the basis of Adam Smith. The candlestick maker and the baker, we trade with each other. As the economy has become more cost sensitive, specialization has increased. Enterprises want highly productive workers and this requires specialization. 
The higher our skill, the more valuable we are and the more we earn. The financial incentives favor specialization rather than broadening our real world skills. Uh, let's see, if repairing a toaster takes two hours and we're paid 25 bucks an hour at our job, that's 50 bucks of our time. If a new toaster costs 25 bucks, why bother learning how to repair the broken one? Hobbyists may repair it, but for most people, it makes sense to throw in the landfill and buy a new one. That's why we have a landfill economy. We measure prosperity by how much gets tossed in the landfill and replaced with something new. If we measure prosperity by how long products last and how easy they are to repair, we'd have a much different incentives and a much different economy. Valuing everything in terms of time and convenience makes sense in an era of endless abundance, but it breaks down in an era of scarcity. If things are no longer cheap and accessible with an on-screen click, then the calculation of what's valuable changes. The conveniences of the 20th century come, 21st century come at a cost few recognize. Our dependence on long supply chains are inherently fragile. These chains of specialized production distribution we depend on all over the world only function if everything works perfectly. But if things are no longer working perfectly, the long supply chains are decaying right before our eyes. The era of abundance has, er has ended and we're not prepared for an era of scarcity. So I just uh, pulled out my book, The Panic of 1819 from Murray Rothbard. Uh, there's, James Grant had done a great book, The, uh, the Forgotten Depression of 1920-21, because there was no government meddling, meddling. But I just want to read you from this part right here. It's very interesting. What appeared to be prosperity from 1813 was nothing but a bubble that resulted from inflationary war finance. Hmm. Inflationary war finance. What have we had lately? Inflationary COVID finance. Is it not right? Yes, we had. We've had inflationary COVID finance. Uh, it was unsustainable, the inflationary war finance of 1812. All right. Um, so we had a war of 1812, and that created finance from 18, uh, inflationary war finance from 1813 to 1818. And the panic of 1819 was the result. As Rothbard shows, there is no widespread confusion on what caused the downturn. Instead, it was widely known that a false prosperity is a very dangerous thing. It always turns to a bust. The Second Bank of the United States, authorized to issue note, had fueled land speculation. Hmm. What else has happened? Are we fueling speculation? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Lower interest rates, easy acquisition of debt. We have, man. Indeed, it was from this boom phase that the New York Stock Exchange was founded in 1817. Born in a bubble, but because there's no intervention, the panic ended quickly and peacefully, just like happened in 1920, 21, but not like what happened in the Great Depression. Yeah, but the point being is, there's so much evidence of this is nuts. Um, you can read all about these various bulls, uh, booms and busts, and the vast majority end, not with a whimper, but they end because people are like, all right, now let's get back to work. Let me show you something else here. This is crazy. All right, so here's a page, uh, page what, uh, 96 for my forthcoming book, Relax and Retire, Debunking Inflation Fears. Index numbers of wholesale prices by years, 1801 to 1935. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, by the way, from 1936. So if you use 1926 as our baseline of 100, you can see 1926 is 100. We can see from 1926 to 1935, the prices, wholesale prices dropped by 20%. It went from 100 to, uh, to 80 in 10 years. All right, now look, here are the inflation years of 1917. So from 1916 to 1917, uh, the, it was at 85, which is 15% lower than it was in 1926, but went from 85 to 154 in 1920. And here's the Great Depression, 1921 to 20, or 20 to 21 right there. All right, so it went from 154 to 97. I mean, that's a huge drop in wholesale prices. Then it went back up from 97 to 96 to 100 to 98 to 103 to 100, and then back down to 80. That's a pretty significant boom and bust. All right, so we got 19, but I'm going to start here. In 1801, it was at 111. Remember, in 1926, it was at 100. It fell from 111 in 1801 to 100 in 1926. That's 11% decline in 125 years. 
but went from 111 all the way up to 154 in 1814. Again, the inflationary times of the post-war years. Look at that. So 1812, 126, 154, 121, 103, 104, then it fell, dropped. Look at that. It's a 65 in 1830. It fell from 1854 in 1815 to 65 in 1830. Uh, 68 in 1854. The war inflationary years, 58 in 1879. You see, that's crazy. Then it stayed in the 60s and 50s, all the way down to 40s in the 1800s. You know, so we got the great crash of 1891 or 90, yeah. 92 maybe 92 so it fell from 55 in 1891 all the way down to 46 in 1897 all right let's go to retail prices and this is from the retail prices from 1890 and beyond again 1926 is 100 so we had 1890 is at 50 1926 was at 100 all right but where was it 1954 and uh, uh 1920 is at 154 you see that? It's crazy. Oh, uh, wait, hold on. This is uh, com all commodities right there. Look at that. So it went from 56 in 1890 to 46 in 1896. And then it went up to 56, 55, 60, 70, 64, 69. Then the inflationary times, 154 to 97 again. 100 in 1926, all the way down to 80 again. I mean, this is, this is nuts, dudes. What's the point? The point is, it's almost like the Build Back Better is trying to tell us, like, look, we, we, we don't have the ability anymore to live this scarcity landfill or a lack of scarcity. The landfill economy, it's over. We don't have it. There is not enough resources that we have easy access to. We haven't built nuclear power for whatever reason. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can blame the republic you can blame the democrats but you know the republicans were in charge for many years too both these guys haven't done it no one has we don't have enough um easily accessible oil anymore that's cheap i mean we still have access to it don't get me wrong we're not going to build solar panels and wind to, to give us the economy that we're used to i just showed you to start with that air travel because it's going to be a luxury these light these the landfill economy is a luxury item that's passed it's just you can see it and when the depressions come the debtors the people in the world are hurt just go watch uh a wonderful life or whatever that story is with that guy you know the banker there owns everybody when there's depression the debtors are in a world of hurt. I've talked about this a thousand times a Sunday. The farms that went out of business in the Great Depression were the farms with debt. They're telling us something, man. They're telling us to get prepared for a lack of the landfill economy. Now they're going to couch it and we got to save the world, but no, they're just saying, look, they don't care. Dude. If they cared, they wouldn't fly. They wouldn't fly their stupid Davos jets. They're not doing, I mean, they're doing it to get rich. I get you. I'm 100%. Don't get me wrong. These guys are complete hypocrites getting rich. But they're telling us in advance, prepare. Because you freaking peons aren't going to be able to use the landfill economy like you used to. Now, the people at top will. You and I are not top. So prepare. Get out of debt. Don't be so specialized. Be anti-fragile. A jack of all trades, a master at none. That's okay. Anyway, love your thoughts. I think it's a pretty important stuff. And, uh, you know, I might be wrong, but uh, I don't think I am. We'll see you.